Prior to joining the AAMC in 2012, Dr. Alberti led research, evaluation, and planning efforts for the Bureau within the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that worked to promote health equity between New York City neighborhoods. He holds a PhD in social medical sciences from Columbia University's Malum School of Public Health and was a fellow in the National Institute of Mental Health Psychiatric Epidemiology training program. So here is a man who has dedicated his life to trying to improve or mitigate inequities. And I like to say, doing what I call ethical research, which is research not just for the sake of publishing, but of actually solving community issues. So without further ado, Dr. Lynch. Do I need the mic? Can you hear me if I just project? Um, uh, thank you. Hold up. I'm going to throw the mic on the floor. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to pull up my slides and get started. It's really an incredible honor to be here uh, at this inaugural Health Equity Summit. And so I'm so grateful uh, for the chance to, to be here for the beginning of these collaborations uh, between community academic institutions uh, and, and the people. Southwestern Michigan. So today we're going to talk about centering community engagement to achieve health equity. But we've made that even more formal through our own, I know the Dean mentioned, WMED strategic planning process. Uh, so the AAMC also recently completed about a year and a half ago its strategic planning process. Um, and you can find more information on the, on the web. And we landed on these 10 uh, areas, priority areas for the foreseeable future. Uh, and one of those areas is action plan number nine. You can see launch the double AMC as a national leader in health equity and health justice. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by health equity, health justice? What does that work look like? Uh, how can organizations like your organizations uh, in partnership uh, and followership uh, with the community uh, drive that work forward? In so we often say in the center that health equity is our goal and health justice is our path. And so we're going to unpack each of these seemingly simple sentences for some time uh, together today. Uh, so we'll start with health equity as the goal. And I can't even really dive in with what we mean by health equity yet, because I think we need to maybe define equity first. I think there have been a lot of new buzzwords in these last two and a half years in this space, a lot of new activity, a lot of awareness raising, which is so exciting. Uh, but in that kind of cacophony of equity and justice, I'm not sure that we've landed on a common understanding of the goals and definitions of the work itself. And so if you're not familiar with Google Analytics, this is one of my favorite new tools. So you can actually search for the popularity of a search term relative to itself. And so this is the popularity of the search term health equity from the beginning of Google, 2004, up until this month, which is last week when I sent the slides in. And you can see that in January 2022, we reach peak, what is health equity? So I, I think we, as, a, as the broadest community possible, still have some work to do. So when I think about equity, I think about equity in three ways. So I think about equity between populations within an organization. You can maybe think of that as uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging work. I think about equity between patient populations, health care, really specific to medicine. And then I think about this broader bucket of work, health equity, that's really about equitable health between communities, either communities defined geographically or by demographic characteristics. Now, of course, these are not discrete buckets of work. Right? There is a story here, there's a through line, because an organization, a medical organization, a healthcare organization, that is truly committed to equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, of course, is going to treat the patients in a more equitable manner. And so there's some some connection there between those first two methods. So and we know from population health science, and this might be shocking, but medical care contributes, I'm gonna say only contributes, about 15% of what makes a person or a community healthy. But still, I'll take 15%. If we can reduce health inequities across the board by 15 or 20%, let's do it. So there is a connection there, a through line. But I think it's important when you think about the work that you are embarking on, that each of these three areas require different skills, different partners, different expertise, and different goals, even if they're connected in a logic model that gets us all the way to health equity at the end, there are different steps along the way. So 
I'm not gonna talk a lot about organizational equity. I know there's a lot of expertise in this room, but here's a, a deeply incomplete parking lot of the terms that we're not gonna talk about in terms of what it means for an organization to truly contribute to a, a sense of equity, diversity, inclusion, and more. So, um, and you can add to this list, I'm sure there are hundreds of other terms that, that conjure EDI or JEDI work for you. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I do wanna say, A, because it's not my area of expertise, right? So I sit solidly in that community health equity, and over my decade at AMC, I began to put a toe in the healthcare equity policy space, but this is not what my training was in. But I do wanna say one, uh, one kind of detour here about the very special relationship between workforce diversity and health equity. I think we just need to talk about this. Uh, and the reason is because whenever I go to an organization, I've been to dozens of organizations, and I say, tell me about what you're doing for health equity. The first answer is always something about pathway programs, workforce diversity, that kind of thing. And so I think it's important to address what that connection is and what it is. And this makes a lot of sense. Right? We talk a lot about social determinants of health, but the social determinants of health are the exact same as the social determinants of wealth, or education, or having a home, or avoiding incarceration. They are the same. Right? So of course those deep-rooted, those fundamental injustices exert influence and create all kinds of inequities that are all tied together, I would argue, and we'll come back to this in a minute, through political determinants of health, through the decisions that we make or don't make, the actions that our policymakers take or don't take that then end up maldistributing all of these vital conditions, all of these social determinants across our communities. Right? So that's another kind of root cause, and we'll come back to that in a second. And we know that if we really want to address health inequities, which is a symptom of those injustices, we absolutely are not going to get there just by treating another symptom, the lack of workforce diversity. Right? That's another, we don't treat the disease by just fixing the symptoms, we want to dig deeply together. It is a collaborative effort to get as close to those root injustices as possible. So I just want to say this, that addressing the lack of EDI in medicine and in research is an imperative that I know we are all in this room 100% committed to, and at the same time it is not a sufficient health equity strategy. It is one component of a comprehensive health equity health justice strategy, it is not the answer. And so there are people and, and, and thought leaders that are, that are better equipped to have this conversation than I, so I'll turn you to this paper by Drs. Cruz, Collins, and Cooper from uh, December or January, very recently, kind of distinguishing these complementary, important partnerships, but it's not the same thing. So I said we're also not going to spend a lot of time about health care equity or equity between health of patient populations, although I, and I, I would love to because a lot of my own independent research focuses on this bucket. And I think, unfortunately, that this is the area that medical care is least committed to, is doing the least amount of work in to actually think about providing equitable, high-quality care to all patient populations. Because that requires some real soul searching, requires some real data analytics requires some real understanding of where your inequities are. And so here are some terms that we could talk about in this space, but we're not going to. We're not going to talk about access or insurance or patient engagement. You'll notice racism and discrimination is common for all three buckets, so let's just keep that, keep that uh, pretty clear. And we're not going to talk about Z codes and social risk screening. I know we're going to talk some about that today with some of the presentations from healthcare partners, but these are kind of those code words for that second bucket. And the third and final bucket where the AMC Center for Health Justice lives and where this conversation today is pitched, here are some, just to round it out, here are some of the things we will talk about, vital conditions for health and social determinants. We'll talk about multi-sector partnerships, community engagement. We might talk about what it means for institutions that have power and privilege, like WMED, to actually walk the talk of anchor institutions. It's not just you're big, you're heavy, you're not going any place. There's more to it than that, to really be uh, an anchor institution and walk that mission. And we'll definitely talk about advocacy at all levels because advocacy is where health equity and health justice lives. So that's equity. So now we'll talk about health equity. So how does the double AMC Center think about health equity? We all have definitions in our head. We heard a great one from the dean already. We come at it this way. Every community begins at the same starting line for health. So simple, but two important things to tease out here. One, community. Health equity is not about individuals, it's about populations. 
right? So health equity has nothing to do, when we get down to it, with what happens in an examination room. It is not one patient at a time. That is not health equity. Health equity is a population health dynamic that can only be addressed by population level interventions that moves entire communities towards justice all at the same time, not one at a time. We also really stress beginnings, not endings, about opportunity for health and not outcomes. And there are some, and we can get into this maybe in, a, in Q and A. There's some lowercase p political reasons that I think it's imperative for health equity champions like all of you to stress that this is about equal opportunity for health and not equal outcomes of health. It's really quite different, right? Because I believe the population health science tells us that if communities truly have equal opportunity for health, the outcomes will follow. That will happen. So let's focus on creating policies and practices and partnerships that truly create the same starting line for health. Equal opportunity, no matter what community you are a part of. So that's health equity. So let's talk about health justice. Um, and I'm going to do this kind of uh, through a tour of my own training. I think it's important to kind of understand my perspective. So I'm a social epi epidemiologist trained by, by psychiatric epidemiologists and a real kind of public health person. And so my first big boss uh, out of grad school was Dr. Tom Frieden when he was the commissioner of health uh, for New York City and then, of course, went on to head up the CDC under President Obama. Uh, and in his kind of transition time, he developed this public health impact pyramid. Anyone here familiar with this? Have seen this before? One or two folks. This is really, this is like fundamental to the way that, that I and the center think about, about health equity. So this is trying to describe what kinds of interventions are most impactful to improve population health. Now importantly, Dr. Frieden would say and has said that you need interventions at all levels to truly be successful. So this, yes, there's a hierarchy of, of impact, but none of these are sufficient on their own. It really needs to be a comprehensive strategy. But let's take a look at what he posits are the least impactful interventions for population health dynamics like health inequities. Kind of the bread and butter of medicine. Educating patients, counseling patients, and providing clinical care. This is not where the juice is for population health. Maybe in the aggregate, we begin to make some movement, but if we really, again, want to change health opportunity for communities, we have to go as, fur as deep down that pyramid as we possibly can to really begin to address the socioeconomic factors, the community contexts, and the policies that create those socioeconomic factors and community context. And so far be it for me, I'm gonna do it anyway to improve on Dr. Frieden's model, but I'm gonna add two other layers to this pyramid that are even more fundamental than socioeconomic status. One, we already talked about the political determinants of health, right? We make these decisions, our policymakers make decisions that make sure that some communities' socioeconomic factors look rosy and other communities' socioeconomic factors do not look rosy. These are choices that we, as the wealthiest nation, in the history of the planet make political choices. And there's a level below, I would say, the political determinants of health. And this is really where kind of my training and background come in, fundamental root causes of illness. So my mentors, and we'll come to this in a sec, Bruce Lincoln, Joe Phelan in the mid-90s, wrote a series of papers, and we're still testing out the model, that social conditions, racism, classism, homophobia, misogyny, xenophobia, those are the fundamental root causes of inequities. That is what gets baked in to our political choices, our political decisions, and that what, that's what leads to this maldistribution of vital conditions across our community. So what, but the lesson here for all of us in the health equity, health justice space is that we have to dig deeply. We cannot rest on what feels, <laughs> yeah, that, it's maybe not the, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, we can't rest at the top of the pyramid the stuff that we're trained to do that feels comfortable, that's easy for us. That is not where health equity lives. We have to challenge ourselves, challenge our colleagues, challenge our learners, challenge our partners, challenge our communities to dig as deeply down into that pyramid towards fundamental root causes as possible. So that's number one when we think about what health justice is. How do we get as deep down that pyramid as we possibly can? So now we're going to explore fundamental causes just a little bit because I think it's, it's really worthwhile unpacking. And we're going to do this through a conversation about the way in which racism impacts individuals and community health. So racism as a fundamental cause of disease. So there's the original site uh, for that Lincoln Phelan paper from 1995. So 
fundamental causes have certain characteristics. First and foremost, fundamental causes, racism, classism, misogyny, etc., they control access to health-promoting resources. And by resources, I don't just mean money. I mean power. I mean information. I mean beneficial social connections. Right? The things that, that create that opportunity for health. Racism, classism, misogyny gets in the way of those kinds of health-promoting resources. The other characteristic of fundamental causes is that they're clever and they take multiple pathways to exert their influence. So here are some, again, deeply inexhaustive list of the various kinds of pathways that racism takes to impact a person's or a community's health. Right? So let's do a thought experiment to, to, to explain a little bit more about the, the wicked cleverness of fundamental causes. Let's pretend that medical care had all of its stuff together and there was no more racism, no more bias, not in our algorithms, not in our clinical encounters, not in our textbooks. There was no implicit or explicit bias. We were 100% anti-racist organizations across the country. Well, the fundamental cause does not care because if you block off, one, you know, dog lovers, cat lovers, everyone, it's about equity. <laughs> right, if you block off one pathway for that fundamental cause to exert its influence, it will find a new pathway and it will have the exact same outcomes, kind of frustrating your inner social justice kitten. So from that pyramid, we learned, I learned, that we have to dig deeply. From this, this fundamental cause theory, we have to dig deeply together in a multi-sector, coordinated, aligned, co-developed effort to address those base, base levels of the pyramid. Right? And so the way that we put this together in the center is to say to achieve health equity, medicine, but you can fill in any sector, medicine, public health, housing, transportation, because those are all of our partners, right? Education must be the best partner it can be in the multi-sector collaborations necessary to change underlying structures and systems. That is the goal. That is the process of health justice. So how have we operationalized health justice? You'll see the original site from this incredible lawyer and housing advocate Emily Benfer from uh, I believe it's 2015. So here's how we in the center have operationalized this framework. We say that for us health justice means one foot in community wisdom and multi-sector partnerships. Right? Those closest to injustice are those closest to solutions to injustice and so therefore that expertise is centered and it cannot just rely on community plus medicine or community plus medicine and public health. It is community plus all sectors together, right? That aligned, coordinated effort. So if that's where one foot is, the other foot is in research to policy action. As Dr. McCorkle said, the research cannot just live in a journal. It cannot just live in a book or a chapter. It needs to be put to use. So how can we galvanize science, population health science, that can actually be embedded in local, state, federal, and organizational policy. And that evidence, that science, is created, co-created, through community centering and multi-sector partnerships. And so we use both of those feet to walk towards health justice in a very explicit, anti-racist and anti-discriminatory way, kind of pitching our work towards those fundamental causes of illness, all those isms and phobias that we just talked about. So how, what does that look like? What does it really mean for our center as you think about the work that you're generating and sparking today? So we'll start on this side, the community wisdom and multi-sector partnerships. So I mentioned that the AAMC recently completed its strategic plan and that kind of gave rise to the center. One of the other things that our relatively new president and CEO did was he added a fourth mission area to our organization and kind of therefore to academic medicine. So traditionally we've always talked about the tripartite mission of academic medicine, research, clinical care, medical education. Well now there's a fourth and it's community collaboration. Right? It is being that best partner. So that's really exciting. So there's a mandate, an internal endogenous mandate for us to do this work that we're talking about. Community engagement. Let's talk about community engagement. I think that is another, uh, if we had a, a Google Trends analytics, we would also see that maybe skyrocketing. It has become almost meaningless for those of us that have trained in community engagement methodologies and practice. Uh, community engagement is not, let me tell you what it's not because it's way easier to do that. It is not, hey community, here are some of my ideas. What do you think of my ideas? Do you like my ideas? Check the box, community engaged. That is not, that is not community engagement, right? Community engagement lives in these words in that green circle. It is about power sharing. It is about co-creation. It is about co-equal. It is about trust. 
right? That is, so when we talk about, and this is brand new from National Academies, February of this year, this is their model to assess what meaningful community engagement looks like in terms of its benefits for partnerships, its benefit for bi-directional or multi-directional knowledge expansion to improve our policies and our practices and ultimately lead to thriving communities. That can only happen when we are living those principles at the center of that circle. So that's how we think about community engagement. We operationalize that in our center. So here's a call to action. We convene a group of now over 1,200 health equity champions from across the country. This group's been around for seven or eight years. It is multi-sector, it is free, it is open to all. Only 60% uh, or so are from an academic medical center. The other 40% are their community partners, business partners, government partners. And in addition to kind of helping us with our research uh, and creating grant applications and writing papers together, they are conduits to local communities for the AAMC. And we'll talk about how we work with CHARGE in service of centering that community wisdom in a second. Uh, we're also trying to walk the walk on multi-sector partnerships. So I'll spill a little tea here. So the AAMC does not have a long history of paying advisory bodies. That's just not something we do. It's more of like an opportunity for our, those advisory bodies to develop professionally. Um, so there's a lot of volunteerism. And we certainly don't kind of populate our advisory bodies with folks outside of academic medicine. So when we had the idea to start this center, we said, well, that's going to be very different for the Center for Health Justice. So we put out a call for nominations in January for our, our multi-sector partner group. We got 75 applications for 10 slots, which was incredible for a, a new organization. And we are paying them uh, as expert consultants for three years at that kind of expert consultant fee. There is only one MD in the group. Uh, the other nine folks represent all of the different sectors that you can see kind of graphically depicted here, civil rights, the arts, public health, education. Um, and we'll talk about how we're working with them, but they are the center's advisory body to make sure that that multi-sector imperative, the metrics that matter to all of those organizations are baked into our work so we can begin to build that local and national movement, right? Because health justice, let's call it what it is, it is a movement that will require buy-in from all of those sectors. Uh, we also do public opinion polling, and we'll have some results in a, in a moment. That's kind of the third way that we think about gleaning community input, and so we can, we can talk about polling. The other side is this uh, research to policy action imperative. And I just want to say this. So first, this is one of my all-time favorite papers from 2006, and I can't believe how we have been treading water since 2006. So this paper says there are three generations of health equity research or healthcare equity research. The first is descriptive epi, which populations, what outcomes, how big. The second generation is analytic epi, why do these inequities exist? How do they come to be? How are they maintained? And the third generation is the science of solution. It's evaluation science. It's implementation science. How do we actually fix these inequities? So I just want you to think back to the, the, the calls for data that we heard over these last two years. The fact that we still have 50, 60 percent missing race, ethnicity, language data. That is a national embarrassment, frankly, and that's still generation one health equity research. Right? Having race, ethnicity, language data doesn't tell us how to intervene, doesn't help us build solutions. There is no intervention for race, ethnicity, and language. Thank goodness, right? That would be insane. So that's still first gener we are still clamoring for the information we as a nation need to get first generation documentation of inequities. Uh, and so we live in our, in our third uh, generation. We are trying to develop with community wisdom, with multi-sector input, that science of policy solutions, again, at local, state, federal, and organizational levels. And this is not easy, and it's not easy as you think about where this kind of work, where the health equity, health justice work lives in your organizations, it probably lives in big, beautiful, gleaming silos of excellence, right? Where, yep, there's some great community health needs assessment work here, there's some great experiential learning work here, there's a health equity research happening over here, there's other, you know, EDI work here, and I am guaranteeing that in some of our conversations we're going to identify opportunities to get that internal house in order to build more connections, to have a more systematic approach to the way in which all of your organizations kind of inside the house connect and coordinate. So when you're connecting this work, here are just some ideas about places that, if they're not in this room, if folks from these parts of your organizations are not here, why are they not here? How do you connect them? How do you bring them in? How do you make sure that there is a single strategy 
for health equity that really leverages all of the different and varied expertise represented by these places in academic medical centers and other organizations of higher learning. Um, so that's, that was kind of like a 25 minute preamble and now at long last, uh, I'll turn just a little bit to the AAMC Center for Health Justice and how we can work together and, and connect more fully. So our, the three things that we try to do in our center uh, is to model, to influence, and to ease the path. So A, we want to model what this process of health justice looks like, what meaningful community engagement looks like, what the arc of that work is. It is long-term work. It is difficult work. It is two steps forward, six steps back, eight steps forward, nine. It is, it is long-term, never-ending work. And so we need to make that clear in the way that we do it, the people that we engage, the processes that we develop. We want to model that for our members, of course. And we also want to mo model that for other national organizations that are increasingly in this space. We want to influence your work. That's it. I want to influence the way that you think about health equity, that you think about health justice, the way that your organizations, right? Because again, I'm going to say that, that health equity is less about individual provider competencies and almost exclusively about organizational competencies. How do your institutions behave in communities, right? And so we want to influence that. And we want to influence the work of federal agencies. And we can talk a little bit about how we've done that uh, already. And, oh, sorry, and we want to ease the path. We want to develop tools and resources that make, if we are convincing in the modeling and the influence, we want to also make that easier for you uh, and your communities to, to do that work and to push that forward. So here are our current four areas of focus that I'll just quickly touch on and then open up for conversation. So trustworthiness, data for health equity, maternal health equity, and then kind of our, our experiment that is just now beginning to clarify that we're calling all in for health equity. Um, and so start with trustworthiness. You will have noticed uh, that in that National Academies model, uh, that trust is one of those 10 principles. I'm also going to toot a little horn of the center here because I'm really proud of this as like the geekiest, proudest thing ever. So uh, for years now, for 20 plus years, almost 30 years, the CDC and NIH have published uh, a book called Commun uh, Principles of Community Engagement. Are folks familiar with that book? maybe a couple of nods. So historically, they've had nine principles uh, of community engagement. Uh, and because of the work that we're about to, to talk about, they've actually added the 10th principle of trustworthiness. So that's a, a big way that we, a big success, I think, for the, for the field. And so I mentioned that we work with CHARGE as a conduit to local community wisdom, that, that collaborative for health equity. So back in uh, February of 2020, you'll recall, we were thinking about clinical trials. And we heard a lot of conversation about community trust. And we heard a lot of uh, experts, public health experts. We heard a lot of political experts, medical experts, talking on behalf of communities. But we didn't actually hear a lot of community voices explaining why they might not be trustful uh, of clinical trials. And, and even more troubling to us in the center at the time was that a lot of the conversation about trust was like this, it was like, oh, if only we had that magical pamphlet, right? That pamphlet that had the right pictures with the right words and the right jar. If we had that pamphlet, we could just like airdrop it in our community. People would read it and all of the mistrust and distrust would dissolve, right? That's, that's what the experts, when we thought that was offensive, wrong, patronizing, crazy. Uh, and so we said we have, to, we have to flip the script and we have to do something different. This conversation is not about trust. It is about trustworthiness. It is about putting the onus where it belongs on organizations with power and privilege to demonstrate they are worthy of community trust. And until that happens, why would anyone trust you? And if you have not heretofore been trustworthy, there's not a pamphlet in the world that's going to that's gonna flip that switch. So we said, well, let's get some community voice out there. And so here's what we did. We had an RFA to that charge group. We worked with nine individuals from that collaborative. Um, we collaboratively developed an interview protocol. We developed new kind of how do you do community engaged research in a socially distanced way during kind of the height, one of the many heights of the pandemic. So we innovated some methods there. And then each of those nine charge collaborators went into their communities virtually. Uh, and interviewed three to five community members on issues of trust and trustworthiness, specifically around medicine, public health, and of course clinical trials at the time. And then importantly, this is really important, because this is walking the walk on health justice, that full collective, all 50 of us, the center team, 
those nine charge collaborators, and all 30 plus community members. We sorted through 30 plus hours of video interview footage. We extracted themes. We developed these 10 principles of trustworthiness. We developed action guides, reflection guides, and I'm gonna share some of these with you and you'll hear, it is not Philip's voice, it is not the center's voice, it is not the AMC's voice. This is community wisdom coming through, lifting that up as the imperative for health justice. So principle number one, the community is already educated. That's why it doesn't trust you. <laughs> right? It is about responsibility and reflection and acknowledgement of not just historical injustice and wrongdoing, but contemporaneous injustice and wrongdoing. It is owning it, acknowledging it, and working through it together. So principle number one. Principle number two, and this is super hard for physicians to hear, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway. You are not the only experts. Right? There is other expertise, not just professional expertise, but lived experience expertise, local expertise. And when it comes to navigating and building solutions to health inequities, the folks that have been doing that for decades, centuries, know a lot more than I do, than most of you do. Right? This is not our expertise. It is about combining expertise. I wish that I could go through all 10, but I'll just flash them up here. I think my favorite one is number seven. There's more than one black church, one gay bar, and one bodega in your community. Right? Diversify the places that you're going. Are you always working with the same folks? So here are the 10 principles. Again, the principles are not just uh, the be all end all of this toolkit. We thought it was important to make this about action. Right, so for each of the principles, we also co-developed an action guide to say, here are some questions that you can ask yourself, organization, or yourself with community partners. Are you walking the talk on this principle? What would you need to do? And it's going to be different from community to community, so I urge you, check out this toolkit, develop your own questions, develop your own actions that will work with your community specifically when it comes to demonstrating that you as organizations uh, are trustworthy. Uh, the trustworthiness portfolio at the center also includes this um, remarkably uh, controversial uh, guide to language narratives and concepts that we released with the AMA's Center for Health Equity. I, I will just say about, I will say this, the focus of this guide is to ensure that our language, whether it's written language, spoken language, whether it's what's in your doctor's notes, whether it's what's in your grant application, whether it's how you are talking about community in your elevator, in your building, that the language you are using is inclusive, respectful, action-oriented, and precise. Inclusive, respectful, action-oriented, and precise. And I'll just give you one of the, the phrases that caused so much stir in October, November. I see the dean chuckling. She probably remembers some of the controversy. Was the, was the word vulnerable. I'm just gonna say it like this. So if you use the phrase vulnerable community, we're gonna, we're gonna help vulnerable communities. All right, what, does that, what does that allow? What kind of next questions does that phraseology allow? Well, it allows certain people to say, well, bootstraps, pull them. Why are you vulnerable? What have you done to make yourselves vulnerable? Why can't you fix it? Agency, individualism, take care of it, that's your fault. If you switch the language and say communities that have been made vulnerable, same word, oh, different set of questions. Made vulnerable, by whom, why? How do we unmake that vulnerability? What will it take? So again, precise, inclusive, respectful, and action-oriented. And the third element in our trustworthy uh, bucket right now is a, a partnership grant uh, through the CDC cooperative agreement uh, that's really focused on building hyper-local partnerships in service of overcoming mistrust and distrust related to COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and we're going to re-up this work, I think, and really focus on the under five population now that that is now available. And I, you can only imagine the mistrust and distrust about vaccinating some of our, our youngest kids. I mentioned uh, our polling, and so our very first public opinion polling was around issues of trustworthiness as well. And so I'm gonna show you one slide because I learned so much from this one slide. So this was September 2021, asking adults over 18 plus in the US, what sectors in their communities do they trust to treat all people in their communities equally? So here are the two shock takeaways for me. So, you know, I, in my graduate work, was a, I'm a community engaged and partnered scientist and policy person. My work in New York City was all about local partnerships. 
And I can tell you in that 15 span, year span of time, we never once, never ever not once partnered with the fire department. Never. But across every single socio-demographic slice, race, generation, age, gender, didn't matter, fire departments were universally the, were seen as the most trustworthy organization. What do we have to learn from fire departments? Why are we working? Who, is, who here is working with the fire department on any health equity, community health thing, right? We are, none of us are. So that was a huge lesson. But I'll tell you, whether it was at Columbia or in the New York City Department of Health, whom we always partnered with. We always partnered with universities and faith-based organizations, 100% of the time. Some communities, some segments of the U.S. adult population, those are deeply trusted organizations. For others, it was like 30, 40%, right? So again, our communities are diverse. They are not monolithic. Different partners speak to different aspects of our community. And that is why the inclusiveness of our partnerships and our engagement is so crucial. I will, and I'll say this last provocative point because I think it's just really, I wasn't gonna say it, but I'll say it. There are more black Americans that trust police departments than young Americans who trust faith-based organizations. So when we're really thinking about our health equity work, we need to take all these nuances into consideration. We have to be uncomfortable with different partners and difficult conversations or else we're not gonna make any progress. We've also done some polling related to the second area of focus, which is data for health equity. I already said, yes, it's an embarrassment. We don't have racial, ethnic, uh, language data. That's crazy. Um, but trust also plays a role here. And that uh, individuals, adults, that are least trusting of our organizations are also least willing to share information, medical information, social information, demographic information. Think about the work that is now kind of sparking all across the country in screening individual patients for health-related social needs, right? The folks with the most health-related social needs are those that are least comfortable sharing information about their health-related social needs. That's a problem. Again, trustworthiness, fundamental consideration. So in that data for health equity, uh, we've written a bunch of comment letters really urging uh, multi-sector data for health equity. So the screenshot here is from an assistant commissioner at HUD, U.S. Uh, Housing and Urban Development, who told this great story at a Hill briefing that we hosted last summer that it's difficult for HUD and HRSA to work together because they define homelessness differently. That's that's, an Im that's impossible. Like, how are we gonna spark the kinds of collaborations that we need federally, locally, right? If, we can't, if our data systems don't talk to each other. So part of the goal of the center is to expand the definition of what data we need beyond race, ethnicity, language, and beyond what's in an EMR to really think through how do we connect community data? How do we give community access to data? The data that the DOE needs, Department of Education, are the same that housing needs, the same that medicine needs, the same that public health needs, and yet none of us have it at all. And even if we did have it, we can't share it. So one of our big initiatives uh, in the Data for Health Equity bucket, which is actually something that this organization helped us think through back in 2016, 2017, uh, is our health equity inventory tool. Uh, so WMED was one of 10 uh, academic health centers that we worked with back in 2016 to build a systems approach to health equity and community health for academic medical centers. And one of the tools that we developed was this tricked out Excel spreadsheet that we called a health equity inventory, which was you kind of dump in project level information, who's running it, what the goals are, who your external partners are, what the metrics of success might be. And then you could run different reports, right? So show me everything WMED's doing about diabetes in the community, that report comes up. Show me everything WMED's doing in the community out of family medicine in collaboration with the mosque across the street, that report comes up. So it helps you begin to identify where your partnerships are and aren't, where the work is happening and where it isn't. Uh, and so we are currently in a two-year project right now to take that tricked out Excel spreadsheet, build it in an online tool called REDCap that pretty much every academic health center has, develop it, co-develop it with community members to say this is not just a getting the internal house in order tool, this is really a partnership creation tool where a community member can log in and say, hey, I just got wind of this new grant opportunity. I wanna identify partners in your institution and other institutions that we might reach out to to build 
uh, that, that grant application and do that work together. Um, so we are currently doing all of that engagement now. We're going to launch that tool, uh, the piloting of the tool uh, in the fall, and then hopefully we'll be out uh, for everyone to use in very early uh, 2024. Maternal health equity uh, is another uh, huge uh, part of our portfolio. We just, uh, a week and a half ago, had a two-day maternal health incubator, which really tried to merge together uh, maternal health and the data for health equity bucket to understand what multi-sector community level data do we need to actually decrease racial ethnic inequities and maternal morbidity and mortality. Understanding that those inequities that are only getting worse and kind of the most unconscionable inequities I can think of, of course there's a role for medicine and racism and bias in healthcare, but it's also about housing and environmental justice, and transportation justice, and food justice. Again, maternal morbidity and mortality inequities are not just a medical care issue. So it really is going to take a multi-sector effort. That was the, the goal of that incubator. And so look for proceedings and recordings coming out uh, in the weeks to come. We're also developing a health impact assessment function. Uh, for the center. We think this is a niche that is really unaddressed and crucial for a health justice perspective, which is when a policy or a proposal is floated, can we estimate the impact that's going to have on inequity? So our first trial, uh, we actually just got the data from CDC last week, is looking at the original Build Back Better 12 weeks of proposed parental leave and what impact, if that was actually implemented, what impact would that have on racial, ethnic, paternal health inequities, right? So we're not, the center's not gonna go lobby for paid parental leave, but we can certainly put out research and analysis that other folks can go and take to their state house, take to Capitol Hill, and begin to advocate for policies that again, shift entire populations towards health equity with one stroke of a pen. Um, and then I mentioned our grand experiment, and this is the last slide, and this is our all-in for health equity. So, you know, we have lots of data in the center from polling, from charge-run focus groups about what our fourth area of focus should be. Uh, we have that multi-sector partner group uh, that I mentioned earlier, and we're bringing those two things together. We're actually at meeting, we just finished meeting five of six, where we are going to kind of ask this multi-sector collaborative to define for us what our fourth area of focus should be. This is deeply uncomfortable for double AMC to give that kind of power and autonomy to say, wait a minute, what? You're not gonna, Philip, you're not gonna, no, I'm not gonna, I mean, I might nudge, but I'm not gonna decide. This is really gonna be, can we develop a fourth area of work that all sectors can say, I can see myself in it, there are metrics that matter to me in it, I understand how I would collaborate in it, and let's build that together. Build the national model to influence the local work. Uh, and so stay tuned, we've gotten it down to two topics right now in a head-to-head -head matchup and we will decide on our fourth area in the next coming weeks and announce that at the end of June. So a bunch of ways to keep in touch with the center, to get involved, to stay connected, join Charge, sign up for our newsletter, um, reach out, uh, we, are, we are very open and I really look forward not only to the rest of the day uh, but to answering any and all questions uh, you might have for me now. So thank you for the time. Thank you for this initiative. Uh, it's great. So. Are there any questions before we take a short break? Are, there are we able to see those slides somewhere? Because there's some points that we had. Sure. Yep. I'll send a PDF to whomever you yeah. tell me to send a PDF to. Excellent. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep it close. I'm going to keep it close. But they're huge and terrifying, but huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the, such, such valuable information. I, I feel like it's worthy of a, almost a lifetime of contemplation for a slide, but we don't have time to contemplate. So, but that's wonderful. so much for uh, really framing the work that needs to be done and, and helping us have a common language around it, which is, so I was chuckling about the, you know, we, we, the absurdity of HUD and, um, and HRSA not having the same definition of homelessness, right? Um, having said that, here's something that sort of keeps me up at night which is the overpromise under deliver. Mm. So being an institution of privilege mm -hmm. with a, a, a very public, making a very public statement about wanting to be 
a, a, a significant community par partner in solving. And you've really raised what I think are it's such important uh, words of wisdom around trust and trustworthiness. Um, so can you just sort of maybe expand a little bit on that, you know, like I say, it's the over-promise, under-deliver, tempering expectations, et cetera, in terms of what really helps institutions do what people need. So the first question that just popped into my brain was whose expectations yeah. are you trying to meet? Do we, have, I mean, and, uh, do we have a sense? Have you done the surveying, the, the talking, the bread breaking, right, across community to understand what those expectations are, what those histories are? So that's like the first thing um, that, that came to mind. I think another just piece of advice is, you know, and I wish I had those principles up again, it's kind of like slow your roll, right? This is a long game, right? This is the foundation that you build is crucial. And so it's not, you know, the goal of health equity is you know, generations long. And so I think it's important to understand what are those metrics that matter to your community, to your trustees, to your education partners, to all the different partners, right? And being very explicit about that. And I think identifying those short-term wins, those short-term outcomes, so you can prove that progress is happening in ways that don't just matter to WMED, but ways that matter to all people in that health ecosystem. And the other thing that, and this is a maxim that we say in the center all the time, the process is as important as the product. And I don't think that, that medicine, just given the nature of the training, given the nature of the trans, it, we're not used to a slow, thoughtful, organic process. Right. And so I think taking the time to do the difficult, like shoe leather work of engagement, right, which can take years. Right, to build those relationships, to maintain, to, to zhuzh up those relationships. That's important, and I think without that, it's really hard to get past it. And so don't overlook the time that it takes to even think about what that process would be and who has to co-design that process and how are you going to hold yourselves accountable for that process. And, you know, and part of that is the internal housework. So who is in charge of coordinating those silos of excellence? Who's in charge of community engagement? One of the other principles is a community, an office of community engagement is insufficient, right? Because it is an organizational competency. All of you have a role for community engagement. You all do engage communities. How do you harness all of that work? And don't just, so you know, don't overlook the process. Take your time. Um, be respectful of understanding those selfish metrics for all partners uh, in the game. Um, and grace. Grace for yourself uh, and grace for your communities. Thank you. <laughs> Probably the rest of you know this, but I am um, not in the medical school world. I'm from Calumet College um, and do public health work primarily. What is the AAMC and who's your audience? Ah, who, yep. Like, how, how do these ideas translate into action and at what levels? And I, the rest of you know that. No, no, I. Oh, no, 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 no. And I said it very quickly at the beginning. But so our members are 155 or 56 MD granting medical schools in the U.S. and 17 in Canada, 400 teaching hospitals, the VA health system, uh, and 80 or nine, 80, 80 academic societies like the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and so that's the AAMC's audience. It's very medical focused. Uh, the center, though is not that, and I think that's part of, right, so the center is broader, and so you, uh, one thing I should have pointed out, like in those principles, the word medicine doesn't appear, the word healthcare doesn't appear, medical care doesn't appear, because the work of trustworthiness is important for medicine as for libraries, for police departments, or public health departments, and so we try to explicitly make it agnostic, uh, charge, like I said, only 60% are from an academic health center, the other 40% are there community or interprofessional partners. Um, but, and even with that multi-sector group, right, explicitly trying to make it not about medicine, in our first couple of meetings, every time we'd brainstorm and kind of ideate together, they wanted to make that fourth domain about medicine because that's where our leverage is. And we keep saying, get out of the box. Play, this is a much bigger sandbox. We, we have uh, carte blanche to, to do something bigger and broader. Um, and so our audience, the center's audience, 
kind of everybody in all communities and anyone, anyone that wants to be a part of the center can be part of the center, but that's not the AAMC kind of mothership uh, main audience. So our first presenter is uh, Dr. Angela Groves. She is assistant professor in the Bronson School of Nursing here at WMU. And the student that will be presenting with her is Geraldine uh, Granados Todd. And they are going to be talking about hypertension and diet relation in African American women. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning. So I wanted to give you a, a background on my previous research and results that led to the current study that I'm involved in, as well as Geraldine. So what we do know is hypertension continues to um, be a, an issue among African Americans, particularly women. And despite the information that's out there on how to manage hypertension, there continues to be a high prevalence. So in 2020, I received a training grant from Pride CVD, which is sponsored by NHLBI, to look at COVID and the impact of COVID and other barriers to following the low sodium diet for African American women who have hypertension. That study began in November of 2020. At the time, African Americans in Cuyahoga County, because this is where the study was conducted at in Ohio, had a higher prevalence for COVID. Also, individuals, African American individuals, had the highest prevalence of uh, hospital admissions, and that was individuals who had hypertension. So, part of the first study aim was looking at the barriers. The second part was community engagement. I wanted to speak with the community stakeholders in order to find out what their facilitators and barriers was to service delivery were during the time of the pandemic. This was a qualitative study. I recruited 30 African American women ages 18 years and older with hypertension as well as 10 community stakeholders. The setting was virtual because of the pandemic. I had about four to seven participants in focus group sessions, <clears throat> which was a total of six focus groups that lasted about 90 minutes and 10 individual community stakeholder interviews, which lasted about an hour. Data was completed, data collection was completed March of last year. So the themes, community stakeholders, these individuals were managers and directors of food pantries, community health centers, community clinics, clinics. These were the people that I talked to, local dietitians. Food choices, this was a problem even before the pandemic in terms of trying to accommodate dietary needs food, with foods in the food pantry. Before the pandemic, they were, community stakeholders were able to provide more fresh fruits and vegetables, more fresh items, but during the pandemic, they received more prepackaged items. But they were trying to accommodate the needs of families because what they saw is an increase, 50,000 first timers that had never been to food pantries that were now using their services. So there was an increase in the need and with the, they had problems with volunteers, so, you know, recruiting volunteers because of the pandemic. So they were stretched very thin. 
And some food pantries had to close because of the uh, lack of volunteers. So that exacerbated food insecurities. When I talk with the, the women, some of the themes were social support and that connectedness. These were, I, I was hoping to recruit younger African American women, but the majority of the participants were older, 50 and older. Social isolation was a, an issue, um, but they talked about this need, the need for a partner they told me, they said, if I had someone who I could partner with, who shared some of the similar experiences and chronic conditions, maybe we can work together and help each other to identify resources, to help hold each other accountable for our management, our health and wellness, to help manage our high blood pressure. Some of the other themes, they talked about this loss of appetite and taste due to COVID, due to stress, depression, anxiety, because of social isolation, because of caregiver burden. Also, the stress eating, the mindless eating, because of anxiety, depression, and stress. Another thing they talked about was this limited ability to, to, to purchase foods in the grocery store because they felt the need to get in and get out. So they really wasn't able to look at food labels and to make informed decisions about their food purchases. They also were concerned about the availability of those food items as well. Mental health was definitely a big issue with the individuals that I um, interview as well as transportation issues. They also talked about the increased use, which was the, also the community stakeholders um, discussion about the, the use of the food pantry. Some of the individuals in the study also access resources from the community centers. So based on that previous study, I decided to develop a feasibility study to determine um, peer support, the use of peer support to improve self-management. This is not anything new, but few studies have been conducted among African American women with hypertension through the use of peer support. We know it works but I want to know if it's going to work with this particular population. So my study aim is to evalu evaluate the feasibility of uh, peer support to improve diet adherence and reduce blood pressure. And also to describe, I want the participants to describe their relationships that they um, experienced during the intervention. So I am recruiting 40 African-American women, ages 60 years and older. They will be recruited from the Ecumenical Center here and Galilee Baptist Church and recruitment has already begun. This will be an eight week intervention that will start August 1st. I have two local dietitians that will um, conduct the nutrition education piece I, as a registered nurse, will do the home blood pressure monitoring piece, and Geraldine will do the communication training. I'll let Geraldine talk more about her piece. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, really quickly, I am a doctoral student in the clinical psychology program here at Western. Um, and when Dr. Groves reached out to me about 
helping her with the communication aspect in this project, my mind went straight to using the skills that we tend to use with um, clients who have uh, been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And that might sound kind of crazy right now, like why did you choose that? But what you should know about this population is that they may tend to be lacking certain skills that help with interpersonal or effective interpersonal skills. Um, and part of effective interpersonal skills are communication skills. And so that's a big part of the treatment that we usually do with this population. Um, and so I decided to use, kind of take the communication skills out of the bigger treatment plan for this um, population. And that's the, those are the type of skills that we're gonna be using and training these um, participants with. And so that's kind of the main gist of the communication training aspect. Um, so I will turn it back to Dr. Groves. <laughs> So I received one internal and one external grant to support this research. The external funder asked if we could conduct booster sessions throughout the eight weeks, meaning the reinforcement of that initial education piece. So that's what we're planning to do weekly, kind of reinforce the diet piece, the blood checking in with the blood pressure monitoring and communication. The hope is that this feasibility study can eventually um, develop into a, a larger proposal for a larger grant. That's what the hope is. Thank you, any questions? Yes. So if you're doing the education component along with the social support, how will you tell if, if there's good results if it's more related to the social support? So what we're going to have the, the participants do is they're going to, we're going to track that communication piece through a log. So they're going to submit weekly, weekly logs to us, and the weekly logs are going to um, determine, well, when they communicate with each other, the mode, what they're gonna talk, what they talked about, how long did they talk about. I have guidelines like week one, this is how the communicate, what you should focus on um, with your partner as far as communication. So every week they have topics to discuss, guidelines to follow. Does that answer your question? Oh, well, sort of. Like if you also have, like you said, that they would require booster sessions and education sessions all along, how do you know if that's what made the improved outcomes or if it's the social support? Or, or maybe it doesn't matter in a feasibility study. Well, we're we also have questionnaires, like um, we're looking at the, um, the DASH diet questionnaire of pre intervention, post-intervention, and they're also tracking their blood pressure logs. So we're gonna track their blood pressures. So that's part of their training. Um, and then there is a peer support survey at the end that we'll implement to see. It, it's, that questionnaire is looking at the effectiveness, if that's what you're yeah. looking at, of the, the peer support. Is the reason that that didn't happen is because more people with hypertension are older, like that's just something? Well, I think it's just, I was told by researchers in the hypertension arena that I need to go where the younger people are. So I guess that's social media. <laughs> <laughs> and not at the senior center, but, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, so, yes. I actually was wondering, Geraldine, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about your communication strategies, training, what, what you're actually doing with that. Yeah. So, um, basically, the type of treatment that I kind of took these skills out of is called DBT, Dialectic Behavioral Therapy. Um, and that's kind of like the first line of treatment that we use, again, for borderline personality disorders and other types of, um, other types of disorders that may put a person in harm's way. Um, so these types of skills, the main two, we love using um, acronyms in psychology. So the first acronym is GIVE, and that stands for Gentle, um, Interested, Validate, and Easy Manner. So basically what the GIVE skills are, are to have a communi or be able to communicate with someone in a way that allows the listener to listen to understand instead of listen to respond. So it allows the other person, or it allows you to communicate in a way that doesn't seem aggressive or like you are um, trying to get them to do something um, just for your own benefit. It allows you to communicate why it is in their best interest to um, listen and, and try to understand and have this, this communication that isn't um, one-sided. It allows for a smoother uh, relationship kind of building commun communication. Um, and then the other acronym is Dear Man. And so that's a little longer, but basically that one is used for, again, allowing the communication to, um, between two people to come to like a, a conclusion that suits both people. Um, and that one is used more to, um, how do I describe it really quickly? <laughs> um, to communicate what it is that you want in a way that shows that you are being assertive, but not, again, not aggressive, um, why it's in their best interest to do what it is that you're asking, and um, easily come to a conclusion. Um, that was a really quick uh, rundown of the two acronyms that we're focusing on, and there's other um, skills that we're also gonna be using, um, like seeming, um, one of them, it's escaping my mind right now, but one of them is seeming uh, confident. And it doesn't mean that you have to actually feel confident. It just means that you should use, like, make eye contact or um, show that you are feeling confidence in different ways, um, even if you might not be feeling it. So these are skills that can be used in like everyday life in many other ways, not just in these types of um, projects, but again, they're, they're very helpful in so many different ways that you can apply them. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Patrick, and I hope I pronounced the last name correct, uh, Joswick, uh, Director of Nursing at uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, uh, and presenting with him will be um, Erica Albers, who is a uh, BSN RN student from KVCC, and they are going to be talking about the whole holistic admissions policy and process. Okay, good morning. Uh, so it's really a, a privilege to speak in front of you today. We have some exciting um, initiatives happening at Kalamazoo Valley Community College. Um, so I'm Patrick Joswick, I'm the Director of Nursing um, at Kalamazoo Valley, and this is Erica Alberts. She's actually a Kalamazoo Valley nursing graduate. 
Um, she recently completed her BSN, and she's also a nursing clinician uh, for the school as well. So we're very happy to show you what we have going on. So, um, you know, the admission process in especially the uh, associate degree nursing programs were a little bit archaic. And I kind of just want to start this conversation with thinking about what is a nurse? And what are those characteristics of make a nurse exceptional? And right now, um, I can kind of show you our current process. This is really what we had in place. So when you're thinking about what makes a nurse successful, how do they impact the community? That's not really being grasped here. What we're really looking at is just their GPA and their metrics and if they have any healthcare experience. Um, so really what we have um, kind of accomplished, and we're starting with our LPN, our licensed practical nursing program this fall, is a holistic admission review. And so the goal is to admit and graduate top tier holistic minded nurses and not always the best scholars. And so that's really the transition that we're moving from. Um, so looking at our community health needs assessment, uh, the number one issue that we have in Kalamazoo County specifically is social and institutional inequities. So three or four years ago when I started the position, I had a conversation with Trice and we talked about where are we at in the nursing program and how are we gonna move forward. Uh, we've had some pretty frank conversations so this has really been a, a work in progress and I'm really excited about the future of what this is going to hold. Um, this is kind of giving you the picture of utilizing a holistic review in other health disciplines and comparing that to the BSN uh, level. And we're not even talking about the associate degree level for a registered nurse. So, you know, nursing, we always aspire to our peers and you can look at the medical schools, uh, public health and PharmD of how those schools are utilizing a holistic review. So we're gonna be probably the first community college in the state of Michigan to implement a truly based holistic review admission process. Um, oh, thank you. The academic and leaders and other institutions, you know, this is not Patrick's idea, this isn't Erica's idea. This is really coming from the federal research down and all of the types of support uh, that are coming with it. So, talking about the double AMC, I mean, this is the model that we're taking and we're making it Kalamazoo Valley specific. Um, I wanted to kind of present to you what our nursing department and specifically faculty felt about moving into this direction. We all know how hard change is. And it was really exciting to see during our nursing retreat uh, last month about the buy-in that we have with this type of admission process. So this is the results from our nursing faculty. And yeah, it's okay to say that we are going to increase the diversity of our student body. That's okay. That's part of the goal and the initiative with this holistic review. And I just get so much pride off of changing the nursing program at Kalamazoo Valley for the better, that they agree with that, and that it's following and supporting the goals of the college. And so from that um, HRSA research back in 2017, um, utilizing a holistic review increases diversity. It also, there's this stigma that if we increase diversity that we're gonna lower our board scores. That's a stigma that we need to throw out. So the federal research is supporting that our board scores are actually going to remain or increase and that our GPA is actually going to increase. And look at the font in blue. I feel like that's what's really important. I'm gonna try to read this too. It improves the teaching and learning environment and that the students are more engaged with the community and they're more open to perspectives different from their own. And that is so much needed in the nursing profession. Um, and so we're really excited about how this is gonna translate into our specific program. I don't need to uh, preach to you about why nursing diversity matters, um, but it's about improving access to care. And we're taking that AAA model and we're improving access to nursing education. I think you all have heard how competitive nursing admissions can be because we just don't have enough seats. And so we're just totally changing the game here. It's not just based off of the metrics. Here's the model that we use the constructs of the experiences, attributes, and metrics, um, and we have correlated those constructs with the values of our college. So the responses and the interviewing process, um, the questions are built off of the experiences and attributes, but also the, the Kalamazoo Valley's uh, values of caring and respect, integrity, excellence and quality, humor and well-being, and teamwork and stewardship. 
So I didn't really want to get into the specifics of how the process works, but here's kind of the snapshot of what this new um, admission process is going to be. We changed that metrics from around 78% to 50%. It's, GPA is still important. We want our students to have that ability to be successful in the nursing program. But then leveraging the playing field, experiences and attributes, healthcare experience, and additional criteria. A 4.0 anatomy and physiology student, if you're a single mom with two kids working nights, it's not that they don't have the ability to have that 4.0, there's just other things happening, but they have those intangible characteristics to make them successful as a licensed practical nurse or a registered nurse. That's what we have going on at Kalamazoo Valley. Happy to answer any questions. Erica, you can speak to anything as well as a former graduate. Um, basically, um, the way that the program uh, is laid out right now. Um, when I first came in, it was the first year that it was merit-based, so it was very, very competitive, and you had people with really high GPAs who weren't getting in. And then you had the people, some people, who were getting in with really high GPAs, but their heart wasn't there. So they had the grades to prove it, but they didn't have, um, they didn't have the heart of a nurse. And so they would get into the program and then they would decide, you know, well, maybe this isn't for me. But then the nurse who was, you know, really passionate, the person who's wanting to be a nurse, who wants to be in the community, um, maybe didn't get a spot because that person decided, well, no, this is just not for me. So I think this way, um, we're, we're asking questions. I think there's also a component of, um, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a questionnaire or something that um, we're asking them why. Why do you want to be a nurse? Because I think that's important. Um, that they're not there just because nurses make really, you know, a decent income, but they're there because they want to be involved in their communities. They want to make a difference in the lives that they touch every day. Um, and it's not just the it's not just the patients, but it's the families and the caregivers uh, that they're impacting when they're there. So they, that has to be important to them as they're coming in, and the part of who they are as they're coming into our program. So in summary, we hope in the next couple of years that our nursing graduates, they look different, they think different, and hopefully that translates to the healthcare that's provided here in Kalamazoo. So, thank you. Yeah, so this is really our first time that we're presenting out into the community of this. Um, our licensed <coughs> practical nurse program is a standalone program, and that's going to be kind of marketed here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we just had that approved. And so with that program, we've changed our admission process. Um, so it, we have had conversations with some of our stakeholders and leaders, and now it's, hey, it's different. Some people thought nursing education wasn't accessible. Now it is. And, and how we have that message to our students, to our community partners is imperative. So we we're kind of stoked just to present to you all. Um, and I'm always talking. <laughs> <laughs> I tell everybody I see, you know, I, I work in the nursing field and so I'm in touch with, you know, families and people who are in the medical field but in different ways. And I'm like, hey, you know, I think you'd be a really good, you know, um, candidate. In fact, I had a, um, uh, uh, she's a CNA where I, where I work and she was really interested in, in nursing and I'm like well this is what's going on and I think you should really apply and she didn't think that she could get in and I know that they had the CARES Act thing and she didn't think that was still going on and she applied and she got it and she was so excited so she's going to be starting her uh, prerequisites this fall and so I just I just try to talk to anybody that I come across who's interested or I think would be a good candidate about what Valley has to offer. So my mom was a graduate of Valley's nursing program back in the early 80s. So it's a great program. And as a kid, I remember her struggle because she was a single parent with four kids. And there were some issues with the professors who like a sick or something they really gave her a hard time about it where other people had you know spouses or whatever yeah. so I mean looking at this I'm excited about opening up but I really would like to see the focus on the 
instructors yeah. and their mindset as you're bringing in people, yeah. you know, from different backgrounds that they understand <clears> the <throat> different, you know, lifestyles or challenges that they may have and understand that as they're going through the process and not holding it against them. The admission is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the resources are really when you are in our program and how are our faculty treating our students? How do they communicate with students? How are you approachable to students? So I welcome you to come to one of our department meetings because I'd love to have you. <laughs> I'll bring my mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that question in the back of the way. Is there a question back there? Yeah, I got a question. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you're also reaching out to other nursing schools, or again, maybe this is a start, but you know, to, to Serving as a model. Well, the, the Brown School of Nursing at Western Michigan, um, Dr. Sally Valim, she was imperative with creating this. She serves on our advisory committee. Um, we've been having those conversations. She's kind of a mentor to me. So um, we do kind of aspire to the four year institutions. But when we're talking about a community college and the students that we serve, this is just natural. This is part of what we do. Um, and so we're really excited about, about what this future holds for us. I think what it does is it changes the way we understand accessibility. We think of accessibility as, oh, I can get in. That's only one part. Yeah. Accessibility exactly. is not only can I get in, but I can also access why I'm there and achieve. Mm -hmm. And I think this mindset is looking at, do we want nurses or do we want academicians? Mm -hmm. And I don't want a nurse who can recite every equation to me. I want a nurse who, when they're coming at me with a giant needle, can make me feel <laughs> like, okay, I can deal with this. <laughs> and I think that's what they're getting, is someone who has the skill, but also the compassion. Uh, nursing is not just a skill set, it's, it's a personality. Mm -hmm. I would make a horrible nurse, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> right here in the uh, black. You had a question? Me? Yes, you did. Oh, okay, hi. <laughs> what about cost? Uh, cost, so, for the actual like process of yeah, it. Yeah, for students, financial aid, tuition, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, that's, that's one thing that I feel Kalamazoo Valley ha has done such a great job with is the financial aid component. With all the different scholarships that we have um, at Kalamazoo Valley, um, we make sure that funding is not the barrier why they cannot go to the nursing program. Um, since I've been the director, that hasn't been an issue. And so, um, there's always funding opportunities that we can create more scholarships to further promote strong families, you know, through the admission process. So, yeah, Thank you. thanks. Just congratulations on this work. I work at Bronson, and this will be something to make sure you share with Bronson and mm -hmm. HR and our chief people officer, Cheryl Johnson, <coughs> because this is that workforce that we need to be help, helping our patients and representing our community as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. You guys have an open house. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah. I'll, I'll organize it. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I just wanted to, um, to touch on you know what you said is like um, making sure that the nurse can make you feel um, you know comfortable and, and secure and um, giving you that uh, patient-centered care. Um, as a clinician, um, my first group we have um, in the long-term care um, a variety of. of patients and um, residents there and um, it was important for me to stress you know that uh, patient-centered you know we don't do everything the same for each person but each person is an individual and um, I make a habit of when we're done with our clinicals um, I think we owe the staff and the residents a thank you for allowing us to be there because it was a learning opportunity for us and um, that was one of the things too that I learned at Valley was um, you know, treating people with respect and dignity and as individuals. And so it was um, a great opportunity for me to put that learning into practice. And so we had a, um, a resident who is uh, totally blind and she uses a, a Braille writer. And just so happened on our last day there, we had an aide who also taught Rails uh, to uh, blind students and, and knew all of that and so we were making out our thank you cards and we were able to um, write our note you know in pen all of the students signed and she was able to type out our message in Braille for our resident and just to go the extra mile each and every time for our, our patients and to make them feel cared for and to um, to feel respected and, and have a sense of dignity 
on their terms, um, whatever's going on in their lives, you know, meeting them where they are. And I think that's um, something that Valley just definitely drives home each and every time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's the whole idea is learning to see the humanity in the people you're working with. Okay, next we will have uh, Dr. Mark Schauer, uh, Internal Medicine at um, the WMU School of Med, and Tucker Morris, who is a med student, and they will be presenting on health screening for the unhoused program. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Tucker Morris. I'm a first year medical student, and uh, I'll be joined up here by another first year medical student, one of my classmates, Amanda Hunt, and uh, Dr. Mark Schauer who will give uh, the perspective as a clinician. Um, and today we're gonna be talking to you about the health screenings that we do at the Kal Kalamazoo Gospel Mission. Um, and I, just to give proper credit to, I adapted this presentation from um, students from the class of 2024 uh, that are um, the leaders of this, uh, of this group. So here's the agenda for today. Um, first I'll go over kind of our mission um, and what we hope to achieve as a group. Um, talk about the data about uh, homelessness in the, in the United States and then also uh, within the Kalamazoo community. Um, talk about some of the screening data that we collect. Um, talk about our impact on the health system and then also the impact the medical students have um, through this organization, uh, community, the Community Health Interest Group. And then also discuss our some of the outcomes we've observed and as well as our future plans. And then if we have time, uh, we'll talk about a story uh, about our experiences. Um, so just broadly speaking, our mission um, is to address the healthcare needs of a high risk population, that being the homeless population in Kalamazoo uh, that has traditionally been uh, neglected. And uh, especially during the pandemic where there's been um, an increase in the increase in difficulty in accessing care uh, across the board, especially in, in the homeless population. Um, and we're hoping to achieve this through uh, this health screening process uh, to connect these patients with providers um, and then also uh, catch any, any diseases early, early in the process. Um, and then I think a good, uh, good sentiment that was shared earlier is meeting patients where they are. Um, so meeting them out in the community at these, at these shelters um, and then also um, there's another interest group, uh, the street medicine group, which goes out to encampments in the community um, and provides similar services. Um, so here I have a, a graph um, created by the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development. Um, this is from 2020. They didn't produce one of these graphs for 2021, unfortunately. Um, but as you can see, Homelessness has been trending down from about 2007 to 2017, uh, but since then we have seen a slight increase in uh, overall um, homelessness. And then in 2021, they only counted uh, people that were considered sheltered homeless, um, so people that were utilizing shelters. Um, and they did not count unsheltered homeless populations uh, just due to the COVID pandemic. Um, so. It, within Michigan specifically, it's estimated that over 3,700 people are experiencing homelessness, um, whether that's sheltered or unsheltered. And then in, uh, specifically in Kalamazoo County, um, it's upwards of 600 people that are unfortunately experiencing homelessness. Um, so what, what's the impact on health? Um, there's significantly higher mortality in this population. Um, it's estimated that it's eight times higher in men, 12 times higher in women. And then the average life expectancy uh, for a homeless a homeless person is 52 years, which is significantly decreased um, from the normal or the typical average life expectancy of uh, an American citizen. Um, we're seeing higher rates of chronic disease, such as diabetes and hypertension. And then also mental health is a big thing uh, that these people experience, unfortunately, um, due to their experiences being homeless. Um, some of the consequences that we're seeing in the clinic, there are higher rates of complications from these chronic diseases because we're they are often coming to the clinic having not seen a doctor for a prolonged period of time. And then these diseases are unfortunately poorly managed. Um, so we're hoping to step in and get on top of these diseases and give these people uh, the health care they deserve. 
Um, so here we have some data. This is um, a little outdated. We collected it from February to June of 2020, um, but we are continually, uh, continuously collecting data to examine our impact. Um, but during this time, uh, we conducted 170 health screenings at Kalamazoo Gospel Mission, um, and then we collected data such as height, weight, blood pressure, blood glucose, um, and did perform pre-diabetic pre screenings um, just to track the, uh, the patient's course and if they had any of these chronic diseases such as diabetes or hypertension, just um, seeing how well these are being managed. Um, so in addition to providing these screenings, we're also um, providing follow-up care, scheduling appointments for these, for these people um, at the Family Health Center. Um, so if there is, are any concerns that we have, they can um, access the follow-up that they need. So the impact on the health system as a whole, um, with these screenings, we're uh, able to reduce health care costs by addressing health concerns early. So before they progress to these later complications that are more costly, um, we're able to step in early and um, help these patients out. Uh, we're also improving patient outcomes by providing access to health services. And we're hopefully increasing trust between the, uh, the shelter residents and the healthcare team. Um, since they haven't been in contact with the healthcare system for a while, we're hoping to be um, their reintroduction into the healthcare system. And with this, we're also assisting patients in navigating the healthcare system. It can be a very daunting task if you haven't been in contact with it for a while, and if you have, um, have this mistrust that is common among the homeless population. So I'll have Amanda talk about uh, the impact that students have. All right, hello, I'm Amanda. Um, Tucker just asked me to come in today to kind of share how this has impacted me as a first year medical student. Um, and this has really allowed me to experience what it's like to form relationships with patients. Um, not only do we all get to practice our clinical skills at these events, but we also get to have conversations and learn more about our patients. Um, I can go in and recognize, uh, recognize patients and work with them long term. So that has been something that's been really vital to my medical education. Along with that, we get to learn how to distribute and educate patients on over-the-counter medications that might be too expensive, um, things like aspirin, cough drops, um, anything that they would need. And also we get to talk to each other. Um, I get to work with a lot of my peers, which has been really cool, um, asking them questions about you know, what they think I should do, and also working with physicians as well. And lastly, we get to be advocates for our patients. Um, I had one experience where I had a patient who was unhoused but also deaf. And so this made her access to medical care even greater of a burden and a challenge for her. Um, and so I got to work with her, I got to work with my peers, and I got to work with physicians. And we kind of came up with a game plan on how to provide the best care we could for her. Um, it involved a piece of paper and an, a pen, but we were able to fully understand, you know, what um, she wanted to t discuss that day, talked about her health, and um, um, really um, was able to create a relationship with her. And so this is some really great out, um, outcomes. We obviously, like I mentioned, get to practice those, that clinical knowledge and also create relationships. Um, and also increases the amount of follow-ups at the Family Health Clinic, like Tucker mentioned. Um, we even provide bus tokens for patients who um, may not have another way to get to the Family Health Clinic for their appointments to really increase the amount of um, follow-ups that we do. And also we get to partner with the Gospel Mission and WMED, um, which has been really great. And we also really get to support our patients. A lot of the things that we do is simply educate, talk about the conditions that the patient may be experiencing and how to manage it and what even they really mean um, so that we can allow our patients to come up with their own healthcare plan for themselves. Thanks Amanda for, for sharing that. Um, so this, uh, this is a logic model, well on the next, on the next slide is a table, but uh, just to give some background about this, we use this um, for our active citizenship course, which is a requirement in our curriculum where we go out and volunteer at community organizations such as uh, Gospel Mission. Um, and we're asked to reflect about our impact um, and uh, what we aim to achieve uh, through volunteering. So we kind of track this through, through the logic model. 
which is shown here. And I think this just encapsulates um, everything that we talked about so far, just the, uh, uh, what we're putting into, um, putting into the uh, project as far as um, our time and our effort, as well as um, some of the things we're using to measure our impact and uh, track these health screenings. Um, and then uh, just as Amanda mentioned, our short-term and long-term outcomes, um, increasing the, um, the health literacy of the homeless population. Um, so they're empowered to make informed health decisions um, with the help of a provider and ultimately um, building an understanding in medical students uh, of how homelessness affects health and some of these obstacles that people face as well as building compassion for, for these patients. Um, so there's always room, in, room uh, for improvement in uh, any activity, um, but I think it's important to recognize what we're doing well as well. Um, so starting off with that, um, we're expanding access to health screenings, so we're performing, at, performing these at Gospel Mission as well as Ministry with Community. Um, uh, at Ministry with Community, we're performing these health screenings on Friday afternoons, and uh, at Gospel Mission, we're performing them on in Tuesday evenings. Uh, so just trying to reach a broader, broader population in the community. Um, as I mentioned already, we're building the medical student understanding of how homelessness impacts healthcare. Um, and I think a good thing uh, of this group and um, of the health screenings in general is that we just have enthusiastic medical students and physicians and staff um, at the shelters that want to make a change in the community. And I think you can see that in the uh, interactions that they have with patients there. Um, some areas for improvement, I think we can um, integrate lessons about treating homeless patients in the medical school curriculum. Um, not every student has a chance to go to gospel mission and uh, participate in these screenings. So I think having something that everyone um, has to learn about, such as this lesson, would, uh, would benefit us as future providers because we'll, we will be interacting with these patients at one time or another in our future. Uh, we're also hoping to provide a wider range of services um, at these clinics, uh, such as vision care and uh, safe sexual practices. Um, and then just also increasing physician awareness of external resources available for the homeless population, such as food pantries and transportation services and ways that these people can uh, uh, gain access to housing. Um, so just to end, end on uh, some of our future plans, uh, there are talks of creating a free student-led health clinic, and this is a partnership between WMED and Gospel Mission. I believe this will be at the uh, fire station that's located close by um, to Gospel Mission. And then we're also hoping to collaborate more with street medicine uh, since we have similar goals, just uh, pooling our resources together and uh, serving a wider, a wider range of people that are considered sheltered homeless and also um, unsheltered in these encampments. So with that, that concludes our presentation. I don't know, if doc, Dr. Shower, if you have anything to add. Probably just a couple of things. Yeah. Thank you. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> so this is a this arose from a student organization, Right Chig, which is a community health interest group. Um, and this was an example of students recruiting faculty, which I thought is just a wonderful way to do this. And so the interest really arose from the students in, a per, in the perception of what the need would be for the community. Um, and I will tell you from my point of view, every time I've set out to save the world, I end up saving myself and pointing out my own um, inadequacies and needs, I think. So I, I think um, this, the education for the students has been in trying to help others, they find out a lot about themselves and what they're made of and what they have to offer, which I think is just amazing. So I, I've been really proud of the group. And, and I, the person who's not here today, unfortunately, is Cheryl Dixon, who's been a, a strong driving force behind this as well. And I've been someone who's also been a, a mentor to the group and, and have been going to these, because uh, you really need to have a faculty physician who goes to the healthcare screenings, because it turns out that the healthcare, healthcare screenings are not just what's your blood sugar, what's your blood pressure, but oh, I ran out of this medication two days ago and now your blood pressure is 180 over 110 and, and what do you need to do in that circumstance? Or I'm having chest pain or, or the blood sugar that's over 500, what do you do in that circumstance? So that has led then to the idea that, well, there probably needs to be some form of a 
of a clinic that's available until you have people, homeless individuals or undocumented individuals, whoever wants to show up, that can be integrated into the medical industrial complex, which is always a hard thing to navigate, I think, from the get-go. So that's, that's what Tucker alluded to as well, is that, that there will be, there is now that is in the planning stage. I, I will point out that even these healthcare screenings, which started pre-pandemic, are still kind of in evolution in terms of, of, of what they're supposed to be and how they're going to be, but um, they are occurring on a weekly basis, both at the uh, Gospel Mission, which is a, a sh they provide a, a dinner and then a shelter, an overnight shelter for homeless, and as well as uh, Ministry with Community, which is uh, known as the drop-in center. So people can go for the day, they can wash their clothes, they can take a shower and do laundry, and they can get a locker and store their, their material goods there, so. Yeah. That's all I have to end. Do you, do you have questions for the students or myself? Yeah. Um, I would just like to know uh, for the Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries, um, what is the general uh, demographic population currently um, that you serve? You know, for? So right. we see, I would say, 80% male. First of all, um, I, mm -hmm. I don't see females as often. And um, I would say, I, I don't really know, I don't think I could come up with a number, but I would say like, we do see more people of color, but I'm not really sure on the ratio of it, because um, I do see like a pretty wide variety of patients. But the biggest thing for me is um, it being mostly males. Um, I think it also plays a role as where we hold the clinic is in the male sleeping quarters. So it's just convenient right. for them. So that's probably why we do see more males than females. And Elizabeth Gibson was going to speak to that, but she's one the director of health care at the Gospel Mission, but she's not able to be here today. So yeah, I, which is why I didn't familiarize myself with all that information, because we just <laughs> found out. So that's a great question of which I don't have an answer. Yes. building more trust. I mean, thinking about your whole focus on trustworthiness, and I noticed you saying that felt like one of the experiences. Um, I, I'm kind of, I'm curious, I'm imagining both, like, us going out in the community as the school the students to where the patients are, and you all as students would maybe be even, like, more well-received even than, I mean, not that people would receive Dr. Shower, Dr. Dixon well, but that there's maybe even something that maybe feels a little safer or trustworthy or inviting as students but I'm curious if I'm hallucinating you that, that no. thought or if you find that to be a helpful element of some of that trust building. yeah I think I think so I think a lot of these people uh, when I do my health screenings like I think they just want someone to talk to uh, they just want to be heard and um, I think that goes a long way just being there to listen to them in building trust and I think I don't know I think we the students do a good job of communicating with them and then also like our uh, our providers there um, should there be someone with a more complicated case I think the residents are able to trust us and able to open up which is which is great yeah. if you have anything and adding to that I think that we really are just a bridge we were actually were talking on the way here how a lot of the time we feel that people just want to come and talk to talk to us and have someone to talk to so a lot of the time I'm just learning more about the patients that I see and also we are that bridge to getting them medications or uh, follow-up appointments at the family health clinic and getting them there so i think one of our biggest goals is to make sure that they are following up with the family health clinic and how we're getting them there but we really are just creating relationships and building trust by just having conversations about them so as, as students working with the, um, the population what are some areas that you see that are challenging the health system that you didn't even have a clue about before you start working with that population Just like the, just how many things can affect someone's health, like transportation, being able to get somewhere to access healthcare, access to like nutritional food. Like um, I'm thinking like downtown Kalamazoo, there aren't many, there's like, I, I can think of Midtown Fresh, but in like downtown Kalamazoo where these people are, there aren't very many like, grocery stores that have fruits, vegetables, things of that nature that they can access. I know Gospel Mission provides food for these people, but 
yeah, just those those factors that I think I take for granted, and um, I that came to my realization when I started talking with these people about how difficult it is to see a doctor. I also think mental health. Um, I didn't realize how big of a um, issue mental health would be is like a lot of the chicken complaints I get is about you know struggling with anxiety or depression and um, a lot of time I I refer them to the family health clinic but I wish I had more resources to give them for that because I do see that quite often. Yeah, I think substance use also is another major factor which we we really haven't launched into but that will be on the agenda to I'm not sure if you can answer this because you're doing this at the Gospel Mission, but my sense is that the people that are at the Gospel Mission are the sheltered homeless as opposed to the unhoused, and that, that trust issue, I, I suspect, is significantly greater for the people that are the unhoused, that they don't feel safe in these environments and they don't want to you know, participate in that. But I would think that that group is having an even greater uh, hurdles to providing care for the people that are unhoused or unsheltered. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, I'm not, are you familiar with the physicians who had the, the street medicine? Yeah, somewhat. So there are now two physicians, two faculty physicians at WMED that are, uh, have as part of their job uh, responsibilities to be involved in street medicine at Kalamazoo. And they are uh, going out to the camps, to the encampments, and they were doing that uh, last year. I mean, really started it in, in full, so. Uh, have you noticed an increase in need of interpretive services from uh, refugees, increased migrants, those kind of things? And how do you use that? Do you have interpretive services or uh, that you use to be able to make sure that there's that level of understanding that the patients are caring for? Yeah, we unfortunately, I don't know of any interpretive services that we have. I do remember a Hispanic gentleman that didn't speak English. And luckily, one of the students there that was volunteering was uh, somewhat fluent in Spanish. Um, so she was able to serve as an interpreter for him. Um, but yeah, with Amanda's case, um, the deaf lady, there's no, no interpreter for that. Uh, luckily, they were able to like, write back and forth. But um, that's, a, that's a great idea to like, hopefully get some sort of interpreter service there. So not like overt resistance to it. I, I can definitely tell when there's like some uh, residents there that are initially like mistrustful of, mistrustful of us and then um, like I'm trying to be conscious of that and just um, try to help them as much as possible but I haven't had any like uh, negative negative experiences that come to mind. Yeah. I think we sometimes just have hesitancy of patients if we ask them, hey, do you want a free health screening? A lot of the times they will just say no because obviously they don't know who we are, what we're doing. Um, but I feel like after they see us there, because we do go bi-weekly, um, they're kind of, ever, all the residents kind of know what we're doing now um, and we can talk to them about, this is what we're gonna do to look at your blood pressure, or we're gonna look at your blood sugar levels just to see like if there's anything that we need to worry about. And after you just kind of talk to them and actually explain why you're there, um, we get a bit more people that are willing, but we still do have some people who are hesitant, for sure. I have a question, because there's a theme that we're hearing from the way the nursing program is changing to having med students go out and experience communities. How is this changing you and how you perceive yourself now as a clinician? <laughs> you want to talk about that one first? <laughs> oh, I got it? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay so. Uh, before I came to medical school, I took a gap year, and I worked as a tech in a psychiatric hospital. Um, so that's like another vulnerable population, and a lot of those people that I saw were also homeless. Um, so I knew, like, coming to medical school, like, I wanted to be involved in some way or form, like, uh, serving that population. And luckily, there was uh, this interest group and these health screenings going on. Um, 
So I think it's just made me, like looking towards the future, it's made me want to pursue that more, like as a physician, like I want to hopefully um, participate, like uh, Dr. Shower here, in a health screening process, just providing that care as a, as a future. I feel that one of the nice things that working with Dr. Dixon has done is, is the students don't need much direction after they've done it a little bit. They'll report to us if things are of concern and we go schmooze. So you sit down, it's, a, it's an open area, you pull up a chair, you sit down next to somebody and say, how are you doing today? And so you know, get to know Chuck and Willie and lots of other folks. So, then you get to talk just as people, figure out where they're coming from. And I think the idea, you mentioned it earlier, Tucker, is meeting people where they are. That's what I think is so valuable about this is, um, you're going into their community. But I see it as, as actually changing how you're going to practice medicine, yep. which is gets to Dr. Alberti's comment. Remember those bottom two things? We have to change our systems and our structures. Mm -hmm. and we change that by changing the people who are in those systems and structures. Mm -hmm. and so I, that's my own two cents. Very good. Thank very, you very so much. I, I want to ask Tucker what stone you picked up over there. Uh, uh, it's <laughs> It's nice. Yeah. Right. I think I think it helped me out a little bit. Yeah, I, think I, I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Very good. Yeah. So, maybe this is a way then to involve the nursing program then, Northwestern or mm -hmm. KBCC, and they can come. I'm telling you. I think that's we, it's hard. yeah, it's a great collaboration. <laughs> maybe I will leave my position as a VP and go into you know, the broker. Um, okay, our last presenter, she is already getting up here, uh, is Reagan, Dr. Reagan Williams from Kalamazoo College, and she's the Director of Careers in Health and Medicine, and she's going to talk about high-touch advising, a tool to improve pipeline to medical school. You're seeing a theme, is we want to change how we think about care, instead of it being transactional, being relational, and transformative. Oh, let's try this one. Yeah, I'll put it right there. Hopefully that'll work. All right. Hopefully that's good. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Great. So like she said, I'm Reagan Williams. I wear several hats at the college, but today the hat I'm wearing for you is the Director of Careers in Health and Medicine. All right. So Kalamazoo College, I've lived here for about five, six years now, um, seems to be this phantom institution that sits up on a hill. So to give you just a kind of brief overview of that exactly what we are, I figured I'd put this slide in. So we are a selective, nationally recognized and globally oriented liberal arts college. We have about 1400 students on campus, variety of states, countries, biggest things, 32% students of color, 20% first generation, all right? We are well known for our K plan. So that's the rigorous academics, if you know any of our students, you know they go study abroad. Um, they have hands-on experience. If you come to a classroom on Case campus and you're not like in group work or something else, something's wrong, okay? And then the last thing is that every student does a senior integrated project, which is an independent thesis at the end, okay? Within my office, which is the Careers in Health and Medicine, has gone through several iterations of name changes. This is what I walked into. Um, but we aim to assist and support students as well as alums as they explore health and medicine graduate and professional programs. I encourage them to go out and look at the revamp website that I had time to do over the pandemic um, and to meet with me to consider what are the areas of opportunity for them, right? Is this the right fit for you? How do you navigate the application process? What should we be doing now to get you where you want to be? So starting in September 2020, which is when I began in the midst of the pandemic, I had no idea where we were even beginning. So I asked the registrar for some basic information. What is the interest of incoming students regarding health, okay? So as you can see from 2016 to 2021, we're roughly sitting at about, it's about 90 students over that time span per year that are interested in health careers. With this being not only medicine, but veterinary, dental, whatever it is. Majority though, mark physician, okay? When I started looking at data in terms of who's applying, what's going on that way, we would figure a four year time span, you graduate, you're likely applying junior year, walking across the stage, hoping to get into a program. As you can see, it's roughly 50% of the students that indicate interest 
by the time they go to actually be able to apply and at that window, even less than 50% are there. Not an issue for me, perhaps you found a different passion, you know, going through the curriculum, the open curriculum that we do have at K. Um, but on average, we have about 30 students and alums collectively that apply to medical school each year. Since 2016, 216 have applied. 68 have been what we would consider BIPOC students. 26, as I would classify them as underrepresented minorities. So if they not marked on their application, black, Hispanic, Native American, I counted them. In terms of acceptance, we've had 81 students accepted, 29 BIPOC, and as you can see, that number significantly decreases for our underrepresented minority students. The question that I began to have is, what makes a student competitive coming out of K? So this uh, scatter plot over here on the left is something that I actually bring into my workshop series for students, so and we have a discussion about it. The open gray circles are students that are not accepted to medical school. The orange colored in circles are students that are accepted. You have GPA on your vertical axis and MCAT score on your horizontal axis, right? And we start the conversation. I say, what do you see? Tell me what you see. And they, of course, immediately go in and say, oh, I need like a 500 on my NCAT. That's kind of where you start to see the orange spread over, right? I said, okay, what about GPA? Oh, I need like a 3.5, yes. I said, but I also look at this person out here that's almost near a 520 MCAT, right? With a nearly 4.0 GPA that didn't get in. And we start talking about the conversation of what happened. That, that would have been a prime perfect candidate. Why didn't they get in? And we talk about the holistic review process that KVCC pers uh, had brought up, the experience attributes and metrics, right? Based on what the data I pulled out of the system in terms of medical students to be competitive coming out of K, GPA cumulative greater than 3.5, science 3.1, MCAT across the board 500 plus. DO 3.25, so slightly less. Um, science GPA about 3.2 still, MCAT 500 or below. The last two cycles that have completely fully closed, so 2020 and 2021, um, the needle is moving, all right? That median science GPA at this point is a 3.6. Um, the cumulative is closer to a 3.7, and then MCAT is sitting at about 5.11, okay? And so for the, some of you that may not know when I say science GPA, that's all your biology, chemistry, math, and physics coursework, all right? So I took this and I said, well, what's the profile of an underrepresented student? Because I saw that drastic decrease in the number of, that applied versus the number actually got in. And so for those that are accepted, their average science GPA was 3.5, which was on par. Uh, cumulative 3.4 and MCAT 5.11. So then I said, well, what about those students that weren't accepted? And you see where the issues are. Their average science GPA is less than a 3.0. Their cumulative is just above a 3.0, and their MCAT is barely tipping over that mark, right? So I began to think about, well, what are my challenges, right? What do, what do I need to overcome to get them to where they want to be? And so it's their engagement with resources. I've been available since the pandemic started. I can honestly tell you I have not seen that many underrepresented students come into my office or engage with what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, creating what I call a growth years culture. So Tucker mentioned he took a gap year. I'm calling it growth years because hopefully gapping you not just binge watching Netflix, but you're <laughs> doing something to enhance your application and growing, right? Um, that's something that is a challenge for us because a lot of our students want to walk out of, you know, want to walk across the stage in June. So a week from now, walk across the stage and two months later, start a medical school program. That may not be the best situation. Of course, I need to enhance metrics, right? Um, with that, this is actually an AAMC brief from 2011 that I pulled out where they had uh, interviewed over 113 medical school admissions officers. To get to the interview, the metrics that the admissions officer said were important, or most important, were cumulative GPA, science GPA, and MCAT test scores. So based on that, which is all academics, I can't get my students, at least my students of color, underrepresented students, to the interview if that's the metrics that they're utilizing to determine, yes, you get it. 
once they've gotten to the interview, things shift, as you can see under that offers acceptance, right? Then they look at kind of recommendations from the interview, letters of recommendation, all that sort of stuff. But if I can't even get you to the table, then we have a problem. So part of that may be in the major selection. So students at Kalamazoo College do not declare their major until winter of their sophomore year, so January of their sophomore year. Um, with that, I have a lot of students that say, I'm gonna major in X science, biology, chemistry, whatever it is. Um, and that's because it aligns significantly with the coursework that you need to apply to medical school and prepare yourself for the MCAT. The issue is that they may not be strong in those areas. So that reflects then in their GPA, whereas they're very strong maybe in psychology or business or English or whatever else it happens to be. And I can work with them to build those courses in, but if I can't get them in the door to engage with me, then they make the wrong decision, right? The other is commitment. A lot of my students of uh, color or underrepresented students overcommit to a lot of things. I try to tell them quality versus quantity but they're out doing 10 student organizations, not two, right, very well. Um, and then how, what, are, what are they doing that aligns with the core competencies that they're looking for you know, in medical school? And then the exploration of healthcare. So finding those shadowing clinical and volunteer opportunities is another thing because some of them have to work a job, right? So how do we get those opportunities in front of them maybe where they're working and still getting paid, but it's still relating to healthcare to help them confirm that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So implementing the high touch advising. With that being said, prior to my role, to my knowledge, from what I gather from my colleagues, um, most of the advising was done junior and senior year, which is too late. So I've gone to a early touch model, which is freshman and sophomore oriented. I call it EPIC. Um, it's explore, plan, invest, and connect. So with that, the explore piece is our health and medicine 101. We talk about the different professions that are possible because a lot of students are medicine, medicine, medicine. I'm like, what about nursing? What about PT? What about PA, right? These are all possible options that you still get to help people, right? So help them make an informed decision about their future plans is what my goal is. Becoming a competitive applicant. With this, this is where I bring in those scatter plots about what does the data look like? What should you be doing? Not only that, at the end of this session, they're, giving, they're given a living action plan, which is essentially a Google document. They register for this. They tell me they're interested in medicine or PA or PT, whatever. That document is tailored to them, and it gives them the opportunity to plan out what does my coursework look like here at each trimester? How do I build in my senior integrated project? When should I be taking my MCAT? What school should I start looking at now, right? What, how do I do all these things? What kind of experiences do I have? And they can start plotting all that out. Then we do these investment check-ins where I'm just available at a certain time for a certain block of time. And you can stop in and just say, hey, I said I was gonna do the shadowing thing last summer. I didn't do it. My question to them becomes, why not, right? If it's, I didn't do it because I didn't have enough time. Okay, well, we've got to figure out how does this impact your timeline. If it's, I didn't do it because I don't want to do it, then we'd start talking about what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? Let's get you connected with the Career Center to reassess what your future goals should be, right? And the last piece is connecting the core competencies, which I think goes back to one of the other presentations where I start talking about what are the transferable skills that you're gaining from either your experiences out in the community, your student clubs, your student organizations. I don't care if it's the business and economics club, right? What's the core competency that you're gaining from there that you can bring into your application? If you're doing communication and teamwork in there, fine, bring it in. Let's see how we can help that inform your pre-health identity, as I call it. Then um, we go to, once we're at that junior, senior, looking to apply mark, we call uh, our health science advisory committee. Um, and this is the touch points where we're helping you to apply, okay? Actually complete the application. So we've expanded this series. It used to be four, four workshops crammed into the month of April with the application starting to open in May for them to start completing it. Um, with that being said, it's now a kind of two year in advance window 
of when you plan to matriculate. We start in the fall with the applicant information session. It's kind of just a general overview. The second workshop is a new one. Um, choosing who to interview is where I've actually had prior applicants that have given me the ability to utilize their application, ID, identify it, and show it to these students and say, your, ex, your team is X med school, your team is this med school. You look at this applicant's information and then you tell me if you would bring them in for an interview or not, right? It not only gives them the ability to see what an application looks like, because most of them have never seen it, um, but it also helps them to evaluate, wait, this applicant looked like this and they didn't get in, or they look like this and they did get in? Okay, I'm on par or I'm not. Um, from that, they're, they're able to do what I call the self-reflection piece. I give them until the new year. So we finished that second choosing who to interview in November. They have into the new year to sign on and register with us and determine from self-reflection. What experiences do you have? What's your science GPA? What's all this sort of stuff? Take some time to really reflect, is this your cycle or not, right? Then we come back in the winter and we do finding your fit. So how do you strategically think about what school should you apply to? I had one student tell me they were gonna to apply to 40 medical schools, okay? The average, the average is 16, 17, right? I said, how are you gonna to apply to 40 medical schools and do secondary applications in a timely fashion, right? Having those conversations and advising them about what's feasible and what's not, right? And then what medical school should you apply to? If, this is the one I give them all the time, if you're interested in being a concierge doctor that just flies around and takes care of, you know, ritzy people, that's fine. You may not fit at WMED. Right? What's their mission statement? What's their goal? What are their outcomes? How do you align with that? If the mission doesn't fit, then don't spend your extra $43 on their application, okay? We talk about composing a personal statement. They need to bring in why medicine, what experiences. Could anyone else write this story? I try to get them to see that it needs to be very personal, right? We do interviewing 101 where the Center for Career and Professional Development comes in and talks about interview tips with them. We talk about how do you actually complete the application because some of the things are very unique with the study abroad experience and everything else that we have, right? We're on units, not semesters and quarters and all that sort of stuff and all the conversions. And then we also do a mock interview with these students to help them prepare for their actual interview and give them some feedback on that. In addition to all of the work that I do, um, I do have student organizations, so a health profession society, as well as the Multicultural Association of Pre-Health Students. Both of these are a resource for students. The multicultural, as you can tell, is geared towards uh, underrepresented students. That organization reached out to me earlier this week, and at this point, um, is going to go on hiatus because they don't have enough interest, okay? So that is where we're standing in terms of pipeline issues. In addition to that, that same student organization came to me earlier in the year and said, we want to engage with alums. We want to know how they got to where they got to. I connected with the CCPD. They rolled out this uh, Hornet huddle model during the pandemic where it's virtual. We get alums to come in and speak with students about various things. I had this list of participating alums that they secured for me. Okay, everything from medicine, pharmacy, MPH to PA, everything, veterinary. And we had about 20 students that actually took advantage of this opportunity. And I can tell you based on the names that I saw on the Zoom registration thing, not a single one of them was an underrepresented student. Okay, so when I say I've got barriers to overcome, I've got barriers to overcome. And anything that you all can provide Please connect with us. I thank you. Any questions? Oh, yes. I think that you may have already mentioned this, but um, how do you engage like students and, and you know invite them to come see you? Like, what are some of the uh, techniques that you use? So during a orientation week. Um, of course, the departments present about their, you know, majors and everything else. I also do host sessions. I host those sessions at the same time, kind of in between biology and chemistry, because that's traditionally where a majority of my medical students come from. Um, and so with that, I give them the ability, to, I show them where the website is. 
That website has a link to my calendar where they can just go schedule an appointment, okay? I give them access, the team code for the MS team site where I post information about everything from virtual fairs that are going on to opportunities in the community, whatever it happens to be that I'm aware of, I put it out there. And then the website is the other resource because when they're up at two or three in the morning and I'm asleep in the bed, um, they can still go out there and find information from what is this profession really about? What are the courses that I need to take at K that align with that? Is this really needed for that school or is this really kind of more for MCAT prep, right? To how do I start looking at schools? How many should I apply to? What's the cost of the application? All that stuff is there for them. And this gets at those bottom two things on the pyramid. A lot of our students of color aspire to be in the medical field. I myself wanted to be a neurosurgeon or get a chemistry <laughs> change yet. <laughs> You know, I'll mess with the brain another way. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is there's an aspiration, but then there's, these are not things I see in my community. They are not things I'm exposed to. So high school and college is actually late to start talking about career. Elementary, junior high is where we need, so by sixth grade, students start losing interest in science. You'll see the research. Mm -hmm. uh, girls start losing interest in science, students of color start, they drift off right at about sixth, seventh grade. Because what happens there is, again, it goes back to how our systems are structured. There is this sense that I don't have the ability. Mm -hmm. I may not have the academic language or the cultural capital, so I don't know how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to change how we present and teach information to students in order for them to keep going. So you can do all the things you want to do, but it's going to be harder because of where the systems that they're coming out of. And so getting folks to see themselves as scientists at you know, fourth grade, third grade, fifth grade, so that they continue to see that this is an option for me. It's very, someone can want to do something and even have the ability to do it, but if it's not affirmed, and that you can say, you know, Oh, you know, you, you can do it, but they need to see it in their environment. Um, mm -hmm. They need to see it, you know, in their instructors. N not that every instructor needs to be the same race or ethnicity, but our instructors need to know how to engage all students so that they continue on. Mm -hmm. So I'm about to jump out of my chair because I'm so excited about this. <laughs> so, um, there, there are two things. Working at WMED, I've learned that a lot of students who came through didn't even want to do medicine at Arizona, they were doc, they were like art students, they were in dance. Mm -hmm. And so when they look at their science, of course they were excelling in science because they weren't focusing on it a lot. So they were able to have that high GPA in science, mm -hmm. but they made they might have been dance or something. Mm -hmm. But they still had this passion to go into medicine. Awesome. So that GPA in science was high because they weren't doing a lot of science. So I mean, but then they had a passion for other things, mm -hmm. and they brought that into the medical field. Mm -hmm. So I mean, even some strategies like that, mm -hmm. you know, what are some other students doing that making them successful? Um, my my other hat, the Mercy Explorers, we partnered with the medical school, and we did that similar thing. We brought girls in as young as third grade, mm -hmm. and they were. I'm going to do a shameless plug, and so <laughs> we actually <laughs> took them to the medical school, and they did a Who Killed Snow White, right? And they had to learn from detectives all the way to pathology, what happened? And they met pathologists, they met toxicologists, they met everybody in these different positions that they had no clue were even existing. They mm -hmm. thought about a doctor and a nurse, when I said name positions, they named like five people. Mm -hmm. When they finished, they named all of these people who were all part of the medical field. So I think a lot of times our students are are scared because like I can't be a doctor, but what about toxicology? What about you know, yep. other kind of science that you can do. What mm -hmm. about using science for a simulation center? Mm -hmm. Where you're using your technology with medical. You know, so I think sometimes we have to be more creative in how we talk to our students of color on what medicine looks like and what are your talents and what can you bring to that. I think a lot of them are afraid because they're like, I can't be a doctor. Mm -hmm. But there's so many mm -hmm. more things where if they can't see that at a young enough age or they can't, you know, know what those other options are, then they drop off. 
because mm -hmm. they're like, I can't be a doctor. But there's so many other careers in the healthcare area that they can still contribute to. No, I was just thinking of um, underrepresented uh, students in college and how um, oftentimes there is so much that, so you can be in a high achiever, right? Mm -hmm. And get into K, yeah. you have to be to get into K. Um, you have this uh, rigorous study. Um, I know several underrepresented students who feel like, when do I get a break? Mm -hmm. When do I get a break from having to sacrifice? And so I see oftentimes that students will transition because they're tired of always having a hardship, a hardship financially, a hardship with this, a hardship with having to get scholarships to even go to school. There is a hardship with so many of those socioeconomic factors that when they come in, um, oftentimes or the language that I have experienced is that they are they're like I am tired of sacrificing so like what are the strategic um, connections or resources in the science field with, with your students the underrepresented students that are under upper underrepresented students that are taking science classes what supports are there mm -hmm. um, and what strategic supports are there for those students so that um, there is that partnership and, and they don't feel like they're struggling alone. Oh. What does that look like? So, so at K, um, in terms of if we're talking about the sciences, so we're talking math, chemistry, physics, I can tell you they at least have across math, chemistry, physics, there is at least one faculty member of color in each of those departments, if not more. Okay, that's one. Um, two, in terms of resources, there is the Teaching and Learning Center that has a, uh, what is this, a new name, uh, science, business, math, economics, some kind of realm in which you can go get support, okay? There is supplemental instruction um, offered in most of the general level classes, though, so that's a peer-to-peer -peer model where there's a student that's done well in that class previously and offers supplemental instruction for those students. In terms of outlets, there is um, Sakuma, um, which is their Sakuma Dow, which is biology and chemistry, and then there's Sakuma Old Upton, which is kind of your math, physics, computer science people. Um, and so that is a resource where it's a student organization and they can go in and talk about different hardships they're experiencing, whatever it happens to be. There is the Dow Council, which is kind of an anonymous Dropbox is available if you're having issues, that sort of thing, you can drop it in. And the council, student representatives from the council meet with faculty within Dow um, to discuss the issues that are, you know, coming up prevalently. So there are things that are available. The, I think the issue becomes because I actually, my husband works in the chemistry department, so I know what some of the issues are. Some of the issues are that they wait until it's too late to take advantage of the resource, right? So yes, week one, because we're on a 10 week system, so it's rigorous, right? So organic chemistry in 10 weeks, right? Week one, right? Week one, you're introduced to your SI leader and the hours are set up and everything else. But if you don't elect to go and get help until week eight, it's a problem. So, how do you get them? It goes back to take advantage of the resource. And they can't say it's not at hours or times that I can't meet because traditionally what the faculty do is they send out a poll to all the students and say, these are possible times, check off when you would be able to meet with the SI leader. And they kind of pick those times where most students can meet, right? So. Can I Sure. Question that I might use in my phone here. How intrusive is the contact? Meaning, I remember being in one of these buildings, Blue Hall, and second, third year, and I got a, um, as I sat down, I got a, an instructor said, Mr. Batson, you need to go to financial aid. And I went, and that's when I found out that I was going to get kicked out of school if I didn't sign this loan. Mm -hmm. 
is that a process that can happen to say, hey, Mr. Batsy, you haven't been to this resource? So, yeah, so we have, I mean, there is an early alert system that the faculty have access to. So if a student is not performing academically well, they can put that early alert in. That goes to the academic advisor um, for said student. Um, and at that point, it's on the academic advisor to reach out and figure out what's going on. In terms of being intrusive to the point of, hey, you're not doing well, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. I think it depends on the faculty member, right? So I can honestly say if, if it's a, an advisee of my husband's and they, it, he gets a message that says, you're not doing well, he's on the email right next, or the Teams, because he sees you on Teams, right? Oh, you're available right now? Let's chat, right? What's, what's going on? Why aren't you doing well in your class, right? So it's, it's all contingent upon, we don't have an advising structure that's set up where there is 10 designated advisors that see these 1,400 students across campus. The advising structure is faculty and staff based, right? So just depends on perhaps who your advisor is. Um, the other thing we have going is we were awarded an HHMI grant a couple years back, which is targeted towards uh, restructuring how faculty think um, about teaching in the classroom, what are some of the things that are going on. So a lot of our courses now have moved away from a traditional points-based system to more of a um, reassessment model. I understand that you may not have gotten it, it's, you know, the first time, right? Learning takes time and people learn at a different rate. So let's reassess. Let's reassess. Let's make sure you're actually really learning what you need to learn to be successful in the next course, as opposed to I'm just going to curve the grades at the end, and I, you just you accidentally got to pass on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the MCAT <coughs> changed, I understand. Mm -hmm. it's, not the, it's not the MCAT I took a long yeah. time ago. Yes. Uh, a very long time ago. Um, <laughs> so have you noticed any difference in the, in, the, in the scores of your students, any of your students, but especially uh, URM students, you know, that, that, you know, have they done better? Because I think that was part of the design of changing MCAT was to, so the, you know, students who went who who went to like smaller to large colleges who didn't perhaps have a background wouldn't wouldn't would do better. Yeah. So so the changes that were made were more targeted towards enhancing the social science aspect, um, the psychology, social. Uh, and so that sort of thing, right? Which our students get because we have an open curriculum; they can take pretty much whatever they want. What I've seen in terms of the scores, because it's now four areas. The, the area where they struggle the most is CARS, which is your uh, analysis and reading section. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. So analysis and reading section is where they, that critical analysis and reading is where they struggle the most, and that's across the board. Um, so what I've seen just trend-wise without kind of really digging deep into that, because I just kind of looked at the overall score, is that I've seen a downward trend in terms of what students are scoring on the MCAT. But I've only been looking at data for, since 2016 because that's all I can really see in this system, if you will. Um, but it's been a downward, downward trend. I'm going to ask that you pose your question because we do have lunch and you get to conversate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to, let's give Dr. Williams a round of applause.